mode. Good day. Thank you for joining us today uh, for this webinar series from Firestorm and the Georgia Independent School Association. Uh, today we're going to be talking about workplace violence. Normally we get to hear Bill Baker at this point, but Bill is out of the office today traveling down to Florida. So it's all good things for moving. I believe that background voice is coming from uh, the Georgia Independent School Association, and I think they just muted their phone, so we got that handled, and we're not picking that up. So as we uh, move forward today, thank you for joining us. You can join us also online at uh, Firestorm Solutions. We'd like you to be our friend there, or you can join us on Twitter at Firestorm Social. And there is a hashtag for the Epic Meeting, uh, and that hashtag is Carrie, if you can mute your phone, I think this is a problem with your computer, so mute your station. Firestorm transforms crisis into value. Firestorm empowers you to manage in crises. Firestorm expertise is in crisis management, critical decision support, crisis communication, crisis public relations, management. And uh, we appreciate you joining us today. And hopefully that noise has now left us and we won't have the, the background feed area. The disclaimer for today is that this presentation is not uh, complete without the accompanying audio and oral comments and discussion. The work product is provided by Forestorm. It should be read in con uh, conjunction with guidance from your uh, personal legal counsel and other authorities. Moreover, the information given and made in this webinar should not be interpreted as legal advice or legal opinion. Today's focus is workplace violence. This is part of the Georgia Independent School Association and Firestorm Crisis Coach webinar series. And today, when we think about workplace violence, we're going to be expanding it beyond the armed intruder concept uh, that we're all faced with, but to frame workplace violence in the, in the aspect that each of us uh, have to comply with within our school. Today's moderator is Candy Lau, uh, who is Vice President of Programs and Member Services and Chief Financial Officer. And talking with Candy, I've always been impressed by how many titles she has at any given time. So Candy, I saw you log on, and hopefully you're with us on an audio standpoint. Candy, are you there? I am here. Welcome. Glad to have you. What would you like uh, to say today about the Georgia Independent School Association? First of all, I want to um, thank Jim and his staff at Firestorm for the webinars. We've had great response uh, back on all the ones previously. I've been losing my voice all morning, so forgive me, everybody. But um, welcome to this webinar, and thank you for being a part of it. And um, look forward to hearing what you have to say today, Jim. Well, our, my pleasure, and glad to do it. Now, you've got an upcoming event. Uh, down in St. Simons in June. Do you want to talk just a little bit about that, Candy? Um, that is our head of school retreat um, at St. Simons for the heads of school. Sounds like a great place to retreat to. And, uh, it is. We have, we have several workshops going on over a two-day period and lots of downtime to be at the beach with families, but um, we're looking forward to having um, some of our sponsors there, I know you'll probably be down there with us. So uh, if any of you are heads that are on the line listening today, we look forward to seeing you at St. Simon. That sounds like a good plan. And Candy and I have been talking about some workshops in the fall and September, and we're going to be doing a survey to focus in on the topics that you want to hear more about or participate in. We'll probably do um, a, one in uh, Middle Georgia and one in North Georgia. And we will focus around in hands-on exercises where you get to make decisions and explore some of the topics in more detail uh, because we'll have that uh, full time together. So uh, thank you to uh, Candy and the Georgia Independent School Association and for everyone sharing with us today. I'm Jim Satterfield, President and Chief Operating Officer of Firestorm and one of the founders. So thank you for being with us today as we talk about workplace violence. As you know, as we start these uh, and each uh, month we talk about what we're seeing in the headlines and we've recently seen the stabbings up in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, one student, two knives, 30 minutes, 20 people injured. Horrific experience associated with that. And when you think about that, look at the length of time from when it started to when it was resolved. 
um, in going through. And as we think about violence today, there's an example. So the Fort Hood shootings that occurred just recently, uh, again, a workplace violence uh, episode that occurred there, the second, as you will remember, at Fort Hood. But I wanted to direct your attention to the quote that I have on the screen. I've just lost my inner peace, full of hatred. I think this was this time the devil will take me. I was robbed last night, and I'm sure it was two flacos. Translation of that is guys. Green light, finger ready, as easy as that. That's what the shooter had posted on his Facebook account uh, the morning of the attack. It was in Spanish, as you see there from the picture. That's a shot off of his Facebook account. He was a father. Uh, had friends on his Facebook and in other areas that other people that knew him. If you'd seen this posting, then you would know that, wait a minute, there's something wrong in this person's life and they need to have help. And as we think about behavioral threat risk assessment, that comes directly in line with this theme. And we'll talk more about that as we go on today. But there was an indicator that was available, publicly aware, on social media, had someone been there, seen it, and known what to do and to take activities. We've just passed the Boston anniversary and uh, of the bombing there from the event, and I'm sure that we've all followed that in the media. We even saw a copycat there, and in line with the copycat yesterday, there was a threat made at Auburn University that there was going to be um, explosions on the campus, and they closed the school for the day as a result of that. Anniversary time dates are always key one, uh, dates for you to keep in mind in terms of security at your school. So it was the, whether it's the University of Columbine or Virginia Tech or um, any other event, those are ones to be clearly aware of. The Kansas hate crime shooting that just occurred, again, uh, there was a specific objective associated with that. Uh, lots of information around those particular individuals. Again, a shooting occurring in a workplace environment. There also was a report yesterday of allegations about a Muslim plot to take over uh, the U United Kingdom schools, particularly around uh, Birmingham. And they uh, took that threat very, very seriously. Now, that aligns with an Al-Qaeda threat immediately after 9-11. And if you really want to strike fear into the hearts of parents, uh, attacking the school would do that. And I think sometimes we feel that the ocean gives us a level of protection that uh, is probably not completely warranted. We've certainly come through a media pattern of severe weather. Uh, I hopefully, along with you, are ready for spring and having a little bit warmer climate than we've had. But with the storms that have come through, we've had a, an exceedingly rough season. And uh, with tornadoes and thunder showers and flooding coming through, again, are highlights to be concerned about. One last note, the Microsoft has dropped support of Windows XP. And I didn't think that would be an impact on us at Firestorm. But as we did our research, we found that most of the ATMs around America operate on uh, the Windows XP platform. So there's a potential vulnerability for that. And so knowing what subsystems your critical vendors use may well be an indication for you to think about within your school. So shifting from those events, we really are continuing our discussion on school preparedness and trying to simplify that as we move through these various topics. So every crisis is a human crisis, and the new norm today is workplace violence. There are over 2 million episodes of workplace violence annually in the United States, and a school is a work zone. Uh, clearly, the largest episode of workplace violence in the United States was the Virginia Tech shootings some seven years ago. And so how you get prepared to deal with that depends on getting your people prepared. And we're going to talk about that as we move forward in this area. But unfortunately, workplace violence is the new norm. There are the 2 million episodes of violence. There's also 2.1 million episodes of bullying in the United States. So the time for us to deal with it is not when that police line tape goes up and the scene has happened at our school. Almost every one of these events have, have been preceded by warning signs. And that's one of the things I want to talk about today so that you can look at what you should be aware of, just as the shooter at Fort Hood had posted those 
that information on Facebook, there are other things that you can do within your school as you prepare in those areas. So the numbers are that we actually are fairly safe because of the law of large numbers. There's so many of us. And when you look at the number of events and the statistics that you see here, um, you've seen some of these are an increase over a period of time. But look at the school. There's generally annually only seven deaths for every 10 million children. Now, that's not calming to a parent if you're one of the seven. But when you look at it statistically, that's the law of large numbers and provides us the first level. But we are seeing an increase. If you look at what's been happening in our schools, and now I haven't done an update for uh, last year and this year, the numbers are increasing. And we're seeing now in a year, and even in some cases a month, more killings than we have seen in the past in the entire decade. So with the statistics that I've shared with you, where our goal here is to intervene at that uh, area where there's behaviors of concern. We don't want to wait until it's threatening and physical injury and death. Your strategy needs to focus on the behaviors of concern and how we work and intervene at that point. So whether it's behavioral threat, risk assessments, or other warning signs, we need to focus. Now, who are our workplace shooters? Uh, uh, they are generally male. Uh, you'll notice 98% by a single attacker uh, uh, in that process. Uh, and twice as many attacks are committed by current employees by form than former employees. Uh, and that's looking across all industries. That's aren't, those aren't school statistics. They are statistics from workplace violence issues that have occurred in a variety of areas. Now, sometimes it comes directly into the school when you think about the shootings two years ago in Jacksonville at the Episcopal School where a teacher was terminated and came, went home, got a rifle, and came back and killed the head of schools. But now if we shift over into the school areas, look at the facts that are associated here. Now I highlighted two in red as you're reading down the list. 75% felt bullied. That's one of the reasons why we talk about standards and best practices and making sure that we have an anti-bullying program in place and identifying it. And then look at the other one, middle of the page. Two out of every three had never been in trouble. So the, that would bring in mind the shooting in Littleton at the Arapahoe School with the uh, young man who had been dismissed from the debate team came back with a gun and felt that that was their only choice. So those are important for us to be aware, but look down at the very bottom, the last two statistics. 80% of the time there's leakage. Leakage means that more, that someone else knew about this event before it occurred. That's the term that we look for. So that's where anonymous reporting becomes very important. And somebody who has seen something, overheard something, read something, or at least had an interaction, you can find out. And you'll see there with the next statistic, two out of three times, two or more people know. So if we put our focus on those last two items, then we're going to be intervening at the point when it's behaviors of concern and not the active shooter who's on the campus. So the statistics are um, quite staggering when you look at all of these uh, ones out of the workplace. And I don't believe the Department of Labor has issued another report since the 2008. But as you look at these, they start to really reinforce this issue for all of us. And as we move from that, there are statutes that require us to have plans in place. Workplace violence has been identified as a hazard by OSHA, and we're required to protect our employees against recognized hazards. And this is a recognized hazard. So this is an OSHA requirement for your school to make sure that you have plans in place. Uh, you can look at two different legal aspects associated with this. The first arises from the responsibility of the employee to safeguard. The second is to do an employee's obligation to respect the rights, uh, employee's rights during an investigation. And there's, we're not today going to go into the investigation requirements associated with what you would do, but ASIS, who is one of the standard setting organizations here, has a very detailed process about how those issues would be carried forward. 
Now, so if we summarize the legal issues, this is where we are. There's OSHA, there's negligence, there's privacy, there's anti-discrimination act, the uh, American Disabilities Act, and there's an attorney-client privilege. These are some of the basic legal principles behind it. Now, the next slide is going to start with you, or it did me, as we were doing our research and we've been working in this area since Firestorm was formed back in 2005. Look at this decision out of Arizona. A corporation may be held criminally liable for the death or serious injury of an employee. And this was a case out of Arizona. So now you're looking at a situation where there could be criminal liability for the death of a teacher at your school in this event. Now, we don't want that to happen. And certainly the criminal liability factor isn't our primary area of concern here. But to know for your board, your directors and trustees, that this is an exposure that your school faces if you don't have workplace violence plan in place. So when we look at what constitutes it, it's divided either in psychological or physical. The, the psychological would be what well, many cases we would think about as bullying or intimidating presence, harassment, obscene phone calls and threats. And we see this area greatly expanding with cyber involvement with postings on Twitter and Facebook and uh, YouTube and if you will remember back, uh, the uh, young lady who committed suicide in Florida last year as a result of the bullying over the internet, all psychological driven to that. And then physical would be very clear, beatings, rape, shootings, stabbings, and suicide. And one common leak that we're finding with suicide is in many cases the person who is committing suicide has a kill list at the school of other individuals that they want to uh, do harm to. And in many cases, their suicide plan is death by policemen in that area so that they would come to school to attack the individuals on their kill list. This is uh, obviously a growing threat and concern. We intervened with a school in Florida last year for a young man uh, that we had learned that was into contemplating suicide. Again, in the leakage aspect that was about it, got through the intervention and the behavioral threat assessment, got them to a, uh, a psychiatrist, and in, in those discussions, it came out with a kill list and the other information associated. So those are the areas that we're thinking about as we're having this discussion. There's a spillover of violence from at home coming into the workplace. Uh, sometimes there's improper handling of stressful events can be the trigger. Um, there's insufficient protection programs for our schools, and obviously, as we've talked about, uh, lockdown, lockout, shelter in place, and evacuation, and lack of appropriate formal behavioral risk assessment and follow-up process. The fourth one here is the area that we're seeing gaps in most of the schools that we're working with, that they don't have a formal program, don't have a trained team to do those behavioral threat risk assessments. And the follow-up, this becomes a case management responsibility because you will then want to follow that student that you have found to potentially be a risk to themselves or others for the rest of their school career. And looking in those areas, and that may well be part of a workshop that we would do in the fall to talk more about it, or we can do an entire webinar on that topic. So this is that chart that we looked at before as a thermometer or a barometer but moving from behaviors of concern to death. When we're, if we're dealing with a person with a gun in our school going down the hallway, we're over to the right of this chart. This workplace violence spectrum, the entire objective is to intervene at the behaviors of concern to mitigate, prevent, or get that person as much help as we possibly can. And your plans and strategies should be focused there not focused at this point when the individual is walking down the hall within your school with a weapon looking at an attack. So as we follow the predict, plan, perform process that you've heard us talk about in the whole planning cycle before, we really want to understand the magnitude and, and effects, identify possible aggressors and victims before this has occurred, and then implement viable solutions. So in understanding it, recognizing that there's risk. Uh, I know we're talking today to the Georgia Independent Schools 
uh, and you've got good students. You've got uh, families that are well represented in, in these areas. But there is risk here. That second bullet, practice active listening, with the leakage that we've already discussed, other people are aware of events that are going on within your school. And if you're listening, if you're looking at social media, if you have anonymous reporting, there's a high probability you'll become much more aware of this before it escalates to the point that the gun is used. Except for personal responsibility, this is the responsibility. This is a governance responsibility for your board uh, to make sure that a plan is in place, directing the head of school and the leadership to make sure uh, that these areas have all been dealt with as we go forward. Now the warning signs are listed here. Uh, as you look at the, the background of the individual, the loner, uh, inflexible, obsessed, paranoid, sense of hopelessness, and if the, the individual feels that they have nothing to lose, those are the ones that we're most concerned about. So look at what has happened in those warning signals across the board. And we can even do this in more detail as we think about uh, our students. But be aware of individuals who might pose a threat. And that's one of the things when we talk about visitor programs on all of the schools and controlling access, annual background checks on our faculty, annual background checks on our volunteers. All of those will be uh, completely a way to identify those risks and threats. And knowing who's going to be there and who would be involved all become a part of the PREDICT aspect. And with that way, we are aware of it. The lower levels are those that have had a loss, a loss of a family member, uh, experiencing levels of depression, uh, who show increased fascination with guns and involvement, or substance abuse, as you see down uh, in the lower levels associated with it. This is the early warning signs that we would be focused on as we talk about behavioral threat risk assessment and movement. Forward. When it moves from the lower tier two to the tier one individuals, now we're looking at specific things, multiple losses, suicide thoughts, uh, people with that gun that's there, intoxication at work or school. Uh, if there's been some resolution and someone was supposed to go to counseling and they dropped out, that would be a trigger. Uh, the shooter at Virginia Tech, Cho, had been found in court to have a problem. He had been stalking one of the students, and the judge mandated that he go to counseling, and he never showed up for counseling. So those are the indications there in the last of volatile mood swings. Now, it's very difficult when you look at a student uh, or an employee on just a single snapshot. And if you were to look at this ball, you couldn't tell whether it was on the way up, at the top, or going down, if we had animated the slide, you would see that on, a, on another basis. But we're always interested in the changes here. Is the person escalating? And if so, if that's increasing, that's uh, another sign of an intervention that needs to take place. So this is all in the predictive mode, in training your people, training your students, creating the anonymous reporting so that you have that information. Doing the monitoring on social media, uh, we were reviewing uh, almost every day. There's a posting in a school in America with uh, the intent of an individual to bring a gun to school tomorrow. And in many cases, we're able to identify that and notify the school system so that intervention can take place before the student arrives with the gun. But so social media, in addition to the others, will help us identify those activities as we go forward. But the predictive thing, we need to then have a plan. There needs to be a comprehensive written policy and process. You need to select how you're going to do it. There are multiple standards um, in the areas that you can select and choose. And if you need some help in understanding the difference between those, we certainly would uh, focus on that. In initial incident notification, reporting protocols, investigation, the uh, assessing the risk, and the risk mitigation plan. Notice the words down below, train, 
exercise, and monitor. The plan is fairly simple to come up with. The detail will be in training your people to recognize those behaviors of concern and be able to and have a process in place to have that communicated. And then on the behavioral threat risk assessment team to make sure that those individuals have trained, that they're trained annually and certified. And we'll be announcing uh, something about certification shortly in those areas. Um, the, the behavioral threat risk assessment that we're talking about takes everything we've said to this point and puts it into a framework. There has to be a policy and a plan, the factor shaping the student's decision-making behavior. Our young people are not as mature in many respects, and so their decision processes are not those of an adult. The warning signs, the risk assessment team, looks like we're up in the A out of risk assessment team there, and a T, it looks like I lost two letters associated with it. The, with defined roles and responsibilities, and then how you deal with it, the investigation of the individual that is a potential risk factor, not waiting for the event to occur, but doing the investigation within that process. And you've talked about the preliminary screening at the high level, and then the more detailed comprehensive one. And in the, the comprehensive level, you may need outside resources within your area, uh, to turn over to uh, even a forensic psychologist that will opine specifically, uh, is this individual a potential risk to themselves or others, the training, the monitoring, and then finally the case management. Once you've identified a student that is potentially at risk to themselves or others, you need to follow that student for their entire career. The, we all remember the Columbine shootings uh, from a number of years ago, and that's Jefferson County, Colorado. They have uh, actually led the country in developing the monitoring and case management responsibilities in following those students. Now, as we're trying to figure out what threats should we be most concerned about, and as we focus on those, you'll see the types of threats listed here. Direct threats, indirect threats, veil threats, and conditional threats. The highest concern that we have is that direct threat area. It's a threat that identifies a specific act against a specific person delivered in a clear, plausible, explicit manner. If you would add to that in a time, then you'd have all the elements, and at that point, you have to take that threat very clearly. So if, if it says, I'm going to come and shoot Mary, tomorrow at school, that's a direct threat. It's targeted, it's clear what's going to happen and the time that's going to take place. In some cases, it could be what the threat is and who the individual without the statement of time. But the direct threats are the ones that we're most concerned about from a workplace violence standpoint as we go forward. The indirect threat is a threat that's unclear, ambiguous, lacks specificity, violence is implied, but the threat is phrased tentatively suggesting that a violent act could occur, not that it will occur. We cannot ignore an indirect threat, but this is at a lower level, and that's where that tier one approach of having at least a preliminary interview, looking at that background, will come together. A veil threat uh, is that strongly implies but not explicitly threatens violence, so it's a little bit more of a statement than indirect but not a specific target and a conditional threat, a threat that's seen as extortion. If you don't do this, I will do that uh, in terms of met, uh, being met. So as you think about these, your organization should be talking about it and understanding it. My main concern is that a threat is made and you're not aware of it. As we think about them, we're dividing those now into various threat levels, low, medium, and high. Poses a minimal risk, could be carried out, although it does not appear totally realistic. High appears to pose imminent and serious dangers to the others and safety of others. This is a sample of uh, how we define threat levels within a school and looking at what they were going as part of their planning. And that's why the plan and the spe specifics are so very, very critical. 
And in fact, the training is the most important element to be able to distinguish each of these care, uh, categories as you move forward and threat levels. These are the type of things that you need to have documented within your school in order to be in compliance from a workplace violence and a, and a behavioral threat risk assessment portion. So think about your school, think about what you have done in this area, and do you have this level of specificity in your current plans as we move forward. So now we're moving beyond just the planning, the predicting, we're going to be training. And in, we will not do uh, a plan without the training. The training is the most important area for you to, to look at. You want to receive investigate and resolve reports in circumstances that give rise to concern for safety. So if you, in your school, if a teacher, if a principal, if a head of school, if an administrator comes forward and shares these activities, you must then investigate and resolve those reports. They cannot be ignored. You want to identify incidents, to identify patterns, and so that we would see how these things evolve and what you want to carry forward. Training the team members as to the proper ways to both investigate and intervene within it. And you'll see last, obviously, consistent discipline, crisis response, case management, monitor, and follow-up. But recognizing when is the behavior in that direct level, when is it an area that you must intervene and to carry forward, that comes from working together as a group. And it should be cross-discipline within your school. Uh, having someone from the administration side, uh, someone that's uh, more from the dean of students, or dealing with those aspects of it, and someone from your security element associated with it, or someone else from your faculty, as you would carry forward. But you want a team of individuals who have been trained in this process. Now, so as we look at the outcomes that come in, you want to predict, and that's where the behavioral threat risk assessment comes in, and the anonymous reporting uh, that's associated with it. Those will be the most powerful tools then added to that will be the monitoring of social media as it would come forward. You need to have a workplace violence policy, an incident management process, and a behavioral risk assessment team. Planning those activities, putting those elements in place, that's where the fundamental building will come together. And then finally, prevention programs, awareness programs, training for teachers, students, and the risk assessment team. Uh, then the case management so that this individual doesn't fall through the cracks. Now, without being specific on all of the events, we have been following uh, several schools as they've worked through resolving a lot of these issues. And we will find that the case management work is not being done. So that they may have identified a person was at risk, they did the interviews, the risk de-escalated, but they dropped following that particular student. And later, that student comes back and creates the violent act. So once you have identified a student who is at risk once, you need to continue to follow that student for their entire career within your school. So predict, plan, perform. Every time you hear us discuss a planning area or an exposure or an element, you'll hear us go back to those three big basic areas. So as you think about your school today, do you have a behavioral threat risk assessment program in place? Do you have a team assigned? Has the team been trained? Have you trained your teachers and students on behaviors to look for? Do you have anonymous reporting? And finally, are you monitoring social media to understand the risk and threats that are there? As you think about the plans for your school, we've been working with the Georgia Independent School Association doing uh, an assessment of your school's preparedness. There are seven dimensions that are needed. We look at five or six data points in each one of the dimensions in coming to the plan. If you've not done that, you can do that at no cost to you or your school. It's a $2,500 uh, uh, program, and it will give you a detail of where you are and where you need to go. Similarly, if you would like to talk more 
about this area of workplace violence and what goes into behavioral threat risk assessments, let us know and we'd be glad to have a conversation with you in those areas. Um, this is one of the benefits of your membership in the Georgia Independent School Association are these educational webinars and workshops. And if there are other topics that you want to see us explore and provide you the information, let uh, Candy know and we'll be glad to add those as we move forward. So Candy, we've talked about a lot of things today uh, and our thanks go out to the Georgia Independent School Association and all that you do for our schools here in the state of Georgia and helping them uh, to be more prepared in the process. Anything you want to share with us at the end of today's webinar, uh, Candy? Uh, just want to thank you again for uh, this wonderful series, Jim. And um, as you alluded to the shooting at Episcopal in Jacksonville last year, uh, that had a school day break, and I had just had breakfast with her at a meeting here in Atlanta two months before she passed away. And um, she was just a phenomenal, um, quiet, reserved, compassionate lady. And when we all heard that, those of us that knew her, it was just, it really put a face on everything, and um, I think everybody needs to be aware that, you know, it can happen. We all see it can happen anywhere at any time, and I thank you, Jim, once again for bringing all this and covering it um, so clearly. Um, and thanks again for this. Our pleasure, uh, Candy. <laughs> I did not. I did not know the uh, head of school in. Uh, Mm -hmm. At Episcopal, we came in afterwards for the board to help them in right. that process. But every story that I've heard of her is that she was truly remarkable and a wonderful person. She was. Person. She really was. And one of the things that we at Firestorm, as we help corporations and schools uh, across the country, we find a common theme of disaster denial. It's not going to happen here. It's not going to be so bad. And we're smarter than everyone else. Unfortunately, we're not smarter than everyone else, and it can happen here. I, my prayer for all of you is that it doesn't happen at your school. Uh, no one wants to have to pick up the phone and to make the phone call. Uh, I led the team at Firestorm at Virginia Tech after the shootings there seven years ago. And Dr. Charles Steger, the president, had to pick up the phone 32 times to call a family and say, your son, your daughter, not coming home today. No one wants to make that phone call. And I think we don't want to see the loss of one life. It's not about gun control. It's not about all these other areas. It's about behaviors of concern. Intervening at that lowest level will provide more security for every school in the country. Formalizing that process, making sure your people are trained, that's going to make the difference to all of us today. If you have a problem and there's an event that's been incurred, give us a call. We will respond to that. And as we started the uh, relationship with the Georgia Independent School Associations last year, we set it up in August and we're going to start in September. And we had a call from a school that was having a problem in August just as soon as we'd set it up. We'll do that initial first hour of consultation with you at no cost. My prayer is that you won't need that. And if you put these types of programs in place, we're reducing those probabilities. So our thanks to the Georgia Independent School Association for producing this Crisis Coach webinar series. Uh, you can go to firestorm.com slash GISA, and you can watch this webinar, or you could uh, view past webinars and register for the future ones. If you watched it today and you would like someone else in your school to view it, again, they can go to firestorm.com. Uh, you can contact us directly at firestorm.com or webinars at firestorm.com if you want to send us an email. Or you can call us at 800-321-2219. Thanks, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful day. I'm glad that spring looks like we finally turned the corner here. And uh, we're in this together. Thank you for all that you do every day. That concludes our webinar today. We look forward to uh, talking with you next month. Goodbye. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim.